Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another week of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control, IIT Bombay. So we are just entering our fifth week of this course. And uh, just to commemorate the finishing of four weeks or one third of uh, what this course is supposed to be, I have changed our background uh, to a very nice uh, SpaceX uh, satellite, which is orbiting the Earth. Um, until now, we had this nice background of a rover on Mars. Uh, and we said that, you know, you use these autonomous algorithms to, uh, you know, determine where the rover is or its position and where it's supposed to go and and there are algorithms that drive the rover uh, in a particular path all right because it cannot necessarily be remote controlled uh, in real time from the earth right uh, similar situation is that for spacecraft also yeah a lot of uh, what we do in adaptive control uh, has to some extent been implemented in uh, by the spacecraft community, by the satellite community. Um, and so in order to maintain both the position of the spacecraft in orbit and also its orientation in orbit, right, which may be a rather mission critical component, uh, we at several um, occasions required the use of adaptive control because uh, uh, it's not very easy to figure out uh, several space parameters like the inertia, mass, etc., of the spacecraft, which are also, of course, uh, losing fuel at a pretty good rate as they are flying. Yeah. So, so anyway, so this is another uh, motivating uh, application for us. In fact, a lot of uh, my own work in my uh, PhD um, in aerospace engineering was, in fact, uh, using adaptive and nonlinear control to uh, spacecraft problems, all right? So, hey, anyway, so hopefully, again, uh, we will continue to see this background for a while, and um, hopefully we can motivate ourselves to, uh, you know, design and develop algorithms that can drive systems such as uh, this spacecraft. All right, excellent. So, uh, what are we doing until now? So, we were, actually um somewhere here right we had not finished uh the lecture notes from previous week in fact yeah and this is why i had mentioned that we should not worry too much if um, we are sort of moving ahead in the lecture notes uh, because i knew that um, as we move forward the material will get more involved and we will start to get a little bit slower okay right uh, Right. So, but by now, I think most of you understand uh, what is the notion. What are the notions of stability? You know, what is the pitfalls in analysis? Uh, you know, how to sort of uh, we had a grip of how to use the Babalat's lemma. Uh, we also saw are now looking at the Lyapunov stability theorems. All right. So, we've already looked at um, the stability theorems until global uniform asymptotic stability so now we are left with only the exponential stability theorems so as, as you all might recall exponential stability essentially uh, is a more advanced version of asymptotic stability i would say and uh, why is it more advanced it is so because it actually gives you a particular rate of convergence to the equilibrium, which is assumed to be the origin in almost all our problems. Okay, so that's the idea of exponential stability. So the question is, what do we require? Yeah, what do we require for exponential stability? So we already have our usual assumptions, right? That, that we need to have a 
candidate Lyapunov function, which means that it is a C1 function, uh, which is positive definite. Okay, so this is the least that we do require. All right. Uh, beyond that, we uh, require V to be decrescent right? because these are the properties that you already have already started to see appearing. So we require V to be decrescent because exponential stability is by uh, definition also uniform. Right? So V is required to be decrescent. Further, we require three class K functions, all of the same order of magnitude. We will talk about what this means soon enough. Same order of magnitude, right? We will talk about this soon enough. Let's not uh, worry too much about what this means. But we require three class K functions such that V is bounded on both ends in this way. In fact, although I have mentioned V is decrescent, but if you look at this particular, <clears throat> uh, if you look at, in fact, let me be careful here. Uh, this is not really required. There is no time argument here. Okay. There's no time argument here. The third one is fine, but here there is no time argument. Okay. Uh, all right. So, um, so what we, if we look at this left hand side, this, what does this mean? This means that V is positive definite. And this is requiring V is to be positive definite. If you look at the right side inequality, this require this implies that V is decrescent. Yeah, so this is not actually required. So if I if I I can sort of say this, this is implied. Yeah, and this guy. This implies, in fact, I should be careful. I should say it's a one way street, of course. This implies that this is positive different. And further, the third requirement is something like this that V dot is less than or equal to some negative of class K function, right? Now, this again, okay, so here also, of course, we don't. Uh, need this time argument, right? Let's be careful. Time argument is not needed. V dot is what we have defined already. Yeah, it is the lead derivative or the directional derivative of V, right? And this uh, particular piece, yeah, this means what? This already means uh, implies. I mean, just not means, but this implies negative definiteness of v of v of v dot sorry yeah so if you look at it 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 seems like everything that we require here is already being mentioned here well i'm sorry everything that's required here we are looking at the local version is already being mentioned here right V being positive definite is part of the candidate Lyapunov function definition. Right? V being decrescent is mentioned here. And V dot being negative definite is mentioned here. So it looks like the conditions are exactly the same. All right. But there's a very, uh, you know, nice and subtle little difference here. And that is these words, same order of magnitude. Okay. This is the difference, same order of magnitude. So here we did require class k functions to claim all of these but we didn't say anything about them being the same order but for local exponential stability we do require them to be of the same order of magnitude all right so this is important let's try to remember this okay now the global version of course uh you know of course it, it moves uh, from v being positive definite to v being radially unbounded and of course you will also require that uh, v be valid over the entire domain rn yeah unlike what's specified up top and right? so we require this also and we require this also that v be valid or v be defined in the entire domain and of course we need now class kr functions three class kr functions all of the same order of magnitude 
such that you have the same type of inequalities. Yeah, I mean, I will again remove these. When you're doing this comparison, there is no time. Yeah, because we are not, when we do these comparisons, we are not looking at x as a solution of a dynamical system, but x as just a variable. All right. So it's not appropriate to put a time argument in here. Okay. And so if this happens, so if you have radial unboundedness for V, yeah, and you have three class KR functions, then you of course you get something uh, like global exponential stability. All right. Okay. So this is the notions of local and global exponential stability. All right. So let's sort of try to uh, see what means for functions to be same order of magnitude okay so we say that two functions in reals so here we are talking about fy and gy mapping to the real numbers they're said to be the same order of magnitude if they are comparable using scalar quantities that is if there exists some scalars gamma 1 gamma 2 positive such that g is bounded on both sides by f scaled by these gamma ones and gamma twos and vice versa okay and vice versa okay because if you see if this happens then the flipped version can also happen, right because uh, from here i can also say that so this this also implies if you notice that uh, i can write f y bounded on both sides Um, one omer gamma one g y and something like one over gamma two g y. Okay, so this is equivalent, right? These are equivalent. Okay, so if basically one function can be bounded on both sides by the other function, then the converse is also true. All right should make sense yeah so two functions are said to be of the same order of magnitude if they can be compared with each other by just scalar quantities scalar constants yeah scalar constants yeah not functions of state not functions of time okay the scalar constants okay so for all the above theorems so this is what it means for the same order of magnitude so for all the above theorems we say that if we satisfy any of uh, these theorems, it is said to be a Lyapunov function. Then that particular V is said to be a Lyapunov function. If it satisfies any one of these, yeah, so any of one of these bullet points, many bullet points, then it is said to be a Lyapunov function, not a candidate Lyapunov function like here, but a Lyapunov function. So, uh, although we don't talk about it, um, but they do exist converse Lyapunov functions, yeah, and the statements always go something like this uh, if um, x equal to 0 is stable for some system star then there exists v t x positive definite such that yeah positive definite and c1 such that something happens okay so this will this is what the converse statements look like yeah the converse statement essentially say that if your system is stable or asymptotically stable or exponentially stable then you're guaranteed to have v with these kind of properties with the you know with the properties that we are talking about yeah that it is it satisfies one of these bullet points okay so they do exist converse theorem yeah they do exist converse theorem but of course it's not uh, it is not a constructive evidence, right? So, uh, just the existence of a uh, converse uh, uh, theorem does not mean you can find a Lyapunov function. Yeah, it's not always easy to find such a Lyapunov function. Yeah, just using the fact that there exists a converse theorem. Yeah, so this is the unfortunate truth. So that's why we don't, we are not really stressing too much on it or actually stating these theorems. Okay. So there's an example that we want to do now. But before we move on to the example, I want us to look back at the previous examples and see if there was any system which was already exponentially stable okay so we did a few examples right 
if you look at uh, let's see did we do a right so here no this was a harmonic oscillator which was just stable then we did okay i mean we could not talk about stability it was in fact unstable then we found a non-uniform stable example then we did this example right this is the um, this is the damped harmonic oscillator if you may. this is a damped harmonic oscillator all right and what did we actually do we, we took a lyapunov function which is something like this right which is kx1 plus x2 squared by 2 and x1 squared by 2 alpha and we could show that v dot is also the same in some sense okay v dot also has kx1 plus x2 square and x1 square okay it has the same terms as this guy kx1 plus x2 square and x1 square right and from here we claimed global uniform asymptotic stability but the fact is that this is also globally exponentially stable yeah why why so the first thing is that v is positive definite and it has, it satisfies all the properties right there. so in fact v is radially unbounded not positive definite v is radially unbounded okay and and so v is uh, lower bounded by a class kr function similarly v dot is also radially unbounded right because it has the same terms as this if this is radially unbounded v is radially unbounded then v dot is also radially unbounded right therefore v dot um, also is upper bounded by a class k function right because it is a negative sign right so it's upper bounded by a class k function and of course decrescence is free because there is no time argument right so therefore it is also uh, upper bound v is also upper bounded by a class k function so v is both upper and lower bounded by a class kr function and v dot is upper bounded by the negative of a class kr function okay so this is one of the things the next thing is same order of magnitude of these functions right same order of magnitude so what are these class kr functions in fact right so if i look at what these class kr functions will be in fact i will take exactly this function itself as my class kr function okay so if you notice i had this uh, phi 1 phi 2 phi 3 in class kr so here I will take my uh, if i may let me make it bigger i will take my uh, let me write in some other color actually i will take my phi one as half uh, k x one plus x two square plus one over two alpha uh, x2 square right which is exactly v ah, okay sorry this is actually x1 square okay. so this is also the same as phi 2 and this is the same as v okay, because i can use the same on both sides and phi 3 i will use as this guy minus 1 minus k k x1 plus x2 whole square no no minus actually not in the class k function plus k over alpha x1 square okay this is what i take as my phi 3 and if you look at phi 1 phi 2 phi 3 first of all these are radially unbounded functions right this is not difficult to verify they are positive definite right how are they positive definite we've already verified this is positive definite earlier so i don't really need to do anything right because this was already done so i don't want to repeat it and you can see from here now radial unboundedness is obvious because if x1 and x2 go to infinity in any direction okay the only problematic direction would have been uh, just a second only problematic direction would have been when uh, kx1 plus x2 is 0 but in that case also x1 is going to infinity still 
because e, if you know x1 and x2 both have to go to infinity in some direction right so the only problematic direction would have been where this is zero but then x1 is still going to infinity so this whole thing is going to infinity so these are in fact class kr functions no questions asked all right now uh, the fact that they are same order of magnitude is also very straightforward to verify you can see that they are just related by some constants just different constants these constants are the only things that are different okay so it's very easy for me to relate phi 1 phi 2 and phi 3 by some in fact phi 1 is equal to phi 2 so the constants are one for to relate phi 1 phi 2 and phi 3 i just need to find another constant right which is very easy because they are just multiplied by some constants here okay so that's it so this is in fact turns out to be globally exponentially stable by this argument okay so we've already seen an example of global exponential stability now if you look at this guy on the other hand right this uh, pendulum or a variation of the pendulum example in fact right if you look at this example it is uniform asymptotically stable but it is not even globally uniformly asymptotically stable because this is not a radially unbounded v okay so so the question is is it locally exponentially stable at least is it at least locally exponentially stable would be the question right uh, this is not very easy to verify this is not very easy to verify because what we have to do is now uh, compare this guy and this guy compare this and this yeah now comparing this and this is not easy because if you look at actually we are going to compare the particular class k r k functions that bound these but even if i try to compare these two quantities see x2 is the same right it's the same function just with different gains so this is not a problem but this one okay could be a problem this one could be a problem because at x1 equal to uh, i mean right so say at x1 equal to pi what happens let's see what happens at x1 equal to pi what happens uh, actually we are not including pi so we might still have some chance yeah um, but this is not very obvious a case of uh, same order class k functions yeah in fact there is a trigonometric formula for 1 minus cos x1 which is i think sine square x1 by 2 i believe uh, yeah i think it's sine square x1 by 2 i will have to verify this though but but i believe it is sine square x1 by 2 but here i have sine squared x1 yeah so we still have to see if uh, these two actually have some kind of an exponential connection with each other uh, so uh, have a same order or a scalar connection with each other okay and uh, this is not super easy to verify i can tell you that okay so it's not very clear if this is in fact locally exponentially stable or not all right for um, almost certainly it is not yeah all right but i will leave all of you to think about this and argue this okay it's a very interesting question is this uh, so the the question we are asking is uh, is this locally exponentially stable all right great now that we have seen this we want to look at this you know very nice tiny little example right so this is the system which is you know highly nonlinear, right it is it actually looks like an oscillator harmonic oscillator until here but then you have some nonlinear terms multiplied by a constant c yeah some constants yeah now we take a very very simple candidate Lyapunov of functions x1 squared plus x2 squared obviously this is uh, positive definite radially unbounded and all the good things yeah and then we take the derivative as always okay we are trying to do a stability analysis so we'll take the derivative okay what happens uh, x1 x1 dot i get i get you know x1 x1 dot and x2 x2 dot and then i simply plug in from here okay it's pretty straightforward this this basically it's a harmonic oscillator so these two terms obviously cancel out they do in all of our examples if you notice and then these two start to look the same c x1 square x1 square plus x2 square c x2 square x1 square plus x2 square so actually if you combine them you get something like this c times x1 squared plus x2 squared whole square 
Now, if we want to conclude negative definiteness of V, which is the minimum thing we would want to do, we want to conclude negative definiteness of V. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, then we well, okay, let me continue. Then uh, we would require C to be negative at least. If C is positive, then there is no scope of V dot being negative definite. It should be obvious to you, right? Because this quantity is positive. In fact, this quantity is also radially unbounded. Okay, this quantity is also radially unbounded. How? You can simply see this by looking at this. It's uh, greater than or equal to C x14 plus x24, but it's actually equal to this plus 2x1 square x2 square. But this is already greater than or equal to 0, so I can say this is greater than or equal to C x14 plus x24, which is of course radially unbounded. Right. Or the negative of it is radially unbounded. Right. So depending on the sign of C, right, if C is positive, well, uh, wait a second. I think, yeah, if C is negative, in fact, this is not correct. This should be if C is negative. If C is negative, then V dot is actually negative definite. In fact, uh, radially unbounded negative definite and therefore the equilibrium point that is the origin is globally uniformly asymptotically stable okay but if c is positive then zero is unstable we will need something called lyapunov instability theorems okay we can actually show that uh, the origin is unstable if c is positive yeah but we will need lyapunov instability theorems which we did not state but that's part of your exercise that's part of your exercise. You have to find the Lyapunov instability and an instability theorem and use it to show that this system is in fact unstable at the origin if C is positive. All right, right. Now, if C is negative, one might even ask why is it not exponentially stable? If you look at this function uh, here, this is radially unbounded. This is also radially unbounded if C is negative, so in the negative direction. So V dot minus V dot is radially unbounded, right? But if you look here, uh, which one, what are the class KR functions? So again, phi1 equal to phi2 will still be half x1 squared plus x2 squared. Since there is no function of time, I can directly use this. This is a class KR function, right? And uh, phi 3 will unfortunately be something like uh, minus modulus of c because c is negative x1 4 plus x2 to the power 4. Now notice that this are different powers. They are similar looking polynomial terms but they have different powers. So you can never compare them by a constant. Right? Because what will happen as x1 becomes larger and x2 becomes larger, this will become significantly larger than these terms. Yeah, and you cannot compare them by the same constant anymore. Notice, I only get to choose a single constant to compare these class KR functions with. Yeah, that is, I can only, oh, I'm sorry, I think it's right here. Right. I only get to choose this gamma 1 and gamma 2 for all, 1 gamma 1 and gamma 2 for all y. It is not a function of y. Yeah, but I cannot do that in this case. Yeah, because x1, 4 will start to dominate x1 square significantly. And similarly, x2, 4. Right? And therefore, there is no way that they are, uh, so they are not. They are not same order yeah therefore there is no way i can get exponential stability all right but i do get global uniform asymptotic stability all right great so what have we looked at today we sort of wanted to complete our discussion on lyapunov stability and we have done that so we were left with uh, exponential stability theorems. So we looked at local exponential stability and global exponential stability, both of which augment asymptotic stability in the sense that they give you a rate of convergence. And this requires us to know about similar same magnitude 
class k and class kr function so we did define that yeah um, we also look back at our examples to see which uh, ones of these which ones of the examples we had already seen where in fact um, exponentially stable and we found that the da damped harmonic oscillator was in fact exponentially stable and uh, we also looked at a new example uh, and you have an exercise of course and we saw that this new example of course is not exponentially stable but can be globally uniformly asymptotically stable if you have an appropriate constant c all right excellent uh, so we will continue uh, we will look at a slightly more involved topic uh, here on and um, it basically uh, sort of um, you know takes the knowledge of uh, persistence of excitation to talk about new exponential stability theorems for linear systems and that is something that's uh, rather useful in adaptive control and parameter convergence analysis all right all right great that's all for today thank you